Today we visited the National Weather Service here in Key West to learn about how they both track, predict, uh, and forecast the weather to keep all of us safe. And it was an amazing tour. Okay, well welcome um, to the National Weather Service here in serving the Florida Keys right here in Key West. Uh, my name is John Rizzo. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist here at the National Weather Service. And uh, welcome to one of the, uh, the, the longest presences, presence of the National Weather Service uh, you know, in the United States. Uh, as you noticed when you walked up, the sign said serving the Keys since 1870. This office is part of a long legacy of offices that have been here in Key West uh, for the National Weather Service. Our beginnings of weather services for the nation started in 1870 when the U.S. Signal Corps under the Secretary of the Army started collecting uh, observations and also uh, started to do public warning you know, for shipping as well as the port here in Key West. And so this is one of the original um, 24 stations in the country uh, that supplied weather services uh, you know, to the United States. But in 1890, uh, that all moved to the Department of Agriculture, uh, where we became uh, the U.S. Weather Bureau. And so, uh, and that lasted through 1940, uh, when finally, under the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce, um, uh, the U.S. Weather Bureau moved under that. And then by 1970, when uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, began uh, covering some of the science and services from the uh, Earth Space Science Administration, uh, the U.S. Weather Bureau became the National Weather Service. So welcome to our lobby here. And uh, we have uh, definitely some icons uh, from those days. If you look over uh, up on the ceiling here, uh, theodolites, you know, date back to the 1500s. Um, that's how we used to look at the, uh, the position of the sun, moon, and stars. And then eventually in our observation program uh, for like weather balloons and being able to track the, you know, how they traveled up through the atmosphere. We know how the wind uh, blew them down. This, this instrument here actually dates back to the early 1900s. That's what you're seeing. And that uh, was actually part of the U.S. Weather Bureau duties. We have the shields uh, from our various uh, uh, you know, stages in time from the Signal Corps um, up for the U.S. Weather Bureau. And then eventually you see uh, from 1870 one of our original U.S. Weather Bureau shields and eventually the National Weather Service. All these pictures are basically snapshots in, in time. Um, from the, the past to the present. Uh, if you look here, we, we actually do pro provide some public uh, you, you know, visitation and, and tours. We have groups, uh, for instance, with our local partners, which include emergency management, fire and rescue, uh, the military. We can't overlook the fact that Key West is a, is a Navy town, but also includes a, a division of Southcom, the U.S. Coast Guard sector. So some of the pictures, uh, if you don't mind look, looking above, uh, this right here, this facility actually still exists today. Uh, this is the U.S. Weather Bureau building. It was built a little shortly after the turn of the 20th century. And that is Harry Boyer, a longtime official in charge of the U.S. Weather Bureau here in Key West. Uh, that facility um, has gone over to private industry and is today known as the Weather Station Inn. It's a bed and breakfast. Okay. But that is actually a U.S. Weather Bureau office. And there's Harry there with his granddaughter up there. Back then, he used to take observations 12 feet off the ground. Uh, today, official observations are taken six feet off the ground. And, and, and so uh, this, this just really establishes the long uh, tradition of service that we've had here in the Florida Keys. As we look to the right, we look at some of the, those little hurricane tags. You know, used to drop out of aircraft uh, to warn the shrimpers and the sponge fishermen oh, wow. uh, back in the early 1900s that hurricanes were coming. And so uh, that's how you got information directly to them. Uh, today you take for granted on VHF radio and, uh, <laughs> and getting alerts as well as no weather radio mm -hmm. and as well as our TV and of course our cell phones today. But, but back when the sponge fishermen were out there working you know, inside the reef there, uh, that was how you got official warnings out there. Wow. And the, the US Navy used to take uh, some of the responsibility of that. On that. And, that. and those practices actually continued even to the 1960s in Hurricane Donna. And you can see, yeah, it's just, just a picture that we took from the, uh, where we launched the weather balloons, the high elevation part of our building. And that is actually what's inside that tower. If you, if you walked up, you notice the, the tower to the right, and that's actually where the weather balloons are filled uh, with helium. And then we send an instrument package uh, twice a day, up in the morning and in the evening, that records temperature, humidity, uh, pressure, and it's tracked by satellite, uses a GPS sensor. 
and that's how we can calculate the wind as it drifts. Uh, we have several generations of instruments <laughs> that I'd like to show you. So this is our display case. Uh, when I started with the National Weather Service back in 1999, we were still at the airport before we had this facility. This is what we launched. This was the entire instrument package. It is called a radio sonde, and so the weather sensors are are inside. This is how the air gets in, and again, it measures temperature, humidity, and pressure. These were tracked by a radio signal that you track by a ground antenna, and that's what the dome in our backyard is. For folks that pass down United Street, you see a big dome mm -hmm. on the top. That's a tracking antenna, and it used to track these type of instruments. As the years went on and electronics got miniature, um, we got miniature in terms of the instruments. Uh, this was the next generation, you see much smaller. Mm. And then eventually beyond that, these, oh, wow. even smaller. Yeah, a lot smaller. And this was the birth of the satellite tracking. So this little squiggly antenna here is actually tra is a GPS antenna. And so they could then get better accuracy on where their instrument was located and that maps the data to its correct location, rather than back to Key West, which is a... Uh, and here's what we use today. Oh, it's even smaller, yeah. okay. And wow. in fact, uh, the telemetry of the data no longer uses the dish. In fact, we're not actually using that big dish, and eventually it will be decommissioned and, and removed. We're using a, a much smaller antenna, which is located up on the high part of our building. You'll see a little white ball, you know, maybe right. about this big. And that's what's listening to the data that this is transmitting. And again, it also has a GPS activity. And you can feel it. You, what do you think about the weight? Uh, that, That's what, maybe a pound, give or you, take? But it's exactly. very light, a lot lighter mm -hmm. than you would expect. Which means we don't have to put as much gas in the balloon, the, the helium, which we know is a precious uh, commodity uh, that we can use much less. Because, it, because the whole idea about sending this instrument up is we have to send it at a fast enough rate that we get the data in due time mm -hmm. to get into the computer models which help uh, us guide you know our forecast process mm -hmm. but not so slow that you know it's, it's taking so much time yeah. on there and of course if it's too slow it means you might not have enough gas <laughs> so that's the different generation uh, the balloons we use today are, are simple latex so this is a weather balloon much smaller than research balloons and the, those long duration ones the design of this balloon is to fly yes yeah, so you put it is to last about two hours in flight the instrument goes up to about at least 17 miles. So we're capturing not just data a few thousand feet above the ground, but all the way up. And that's important for computer models because they look at the atmosphere throughout a depth. We want to know what's going on above our head if you want to know what's coming down on your head. So that's important there. And these are so light that we don't need a parachute or anything. They don't fall so fast that, they, you know, mm -hmm. that they're gonna hit the ground very hard at all. There's some other things that we uh, also track as well, or, or keep here in the display case. Um, just to remind us in the hurricane uh, program, this was something that the Monroe County Emergency Management gifted to us shortly after we got the building, and this is obviously not a functional instrument. This is a, a wind vane. Um, back in the old days, wind <laughs> instruments, if you look up at the top here, here's an example. These instruments were kind of used throughout the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We used the three cup anemometer. This wind vane is actually from the Ocean Reef Public Safety Building, their older building, which uh, no longer exists today, mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, stripped off the roof of the building from Hurricane Andrew. It was found a half mile away. It basically okay. tumbled. Um, folks that remember that while everyone thinks of Miami, Hurricane Andrew, the far northern part of the Keys did get Category 3 sustained conditions, and there was a lot of damage up in there in, in the Ocean Reef area. And so this was gifted us as a reminder of the power of hurricanes. Oh, there. Speaking of hurricanes, if I can draw your attention up to the ceiling of our building, I bet you noticed our hurricane flags. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the, this is part of the signal core of flag system. When you fly two red flags with the black square center, uh, flying two of them means hurricane warning. Um, these were the flags that were actually flown during both Hurricane Irma in 2017 and Wilma, which was shortly after we, we, we came to occupy this building in 2005. And uh, if you actually experience the hurricane conditions, the sustained winds, uh, we, we retire the flags and it's signed by all the folks that were working here at the time on there. So all of our, 
forecasters, meteorologists, and technicians. Yeah. So We're during the hurricane, will you guys stay here in the building? Yeah. Or? And that's, that's a fantastic segue to talk about that. This building is built for us to operate during the crucial hours of the storm. And uh, you know, it's, as far as its rating, um, it's designed for about 180 miles per hour. It actually includes a, a kind of a shelter area that surrounds the bathroom. You know, very thick walls. Uh, Chip will be showing you in a little bit. Okay. Um, and you know, should there be a problem with the facility, we do have a safe room that includes the restrooms um, where we would be able to go in the interior. But th that brings up a good point: is you know, the most critical hours before a major hurricane landfall is that critical six to twelve hours where evacuations need to cease, where folks need to be in shelter. And, uh, and letting the emergency managers know at that precise time that the weather conditions go downhill. Mm -hmm. And because of where we are in the Florida Keys, that's, you, you can't just fly out two hours before a hurricane hits. And so we're, this allows us to concentrate on that mission and provide those, that information to not just the county, the mm -hmm. state, but also federal offices, the military as well, and provide that 24-7 uh, service as well. Um, there's a full, our full staff complement is 22 full-time employees. Uh, as you imagine, the, mo the vast majority are degreed uh, meteorologists. Um, and that includes uh, you know, about six lead forecasters. Uh, they are actually in charge of the shift, so they're the round-the-clock uh, folks that are in charge of the shift. We have about a, a complement of eight uh, what we call general uh, meteorologists. They're, they're ones that are working through their careers uh, earlier on. Uh, we also have technicians, electronics technicians to service equipment, an IT officer. And in the management structure, uh, we have uh, myself. Uh, it's a warning coordination meteorologist. And I'm the liaison uh, between this office and its services and that outside world, those emergency managers, it, the military and such. Uh, we have a science and operations officer who's worried about inside the house, research to operations, our training officer. And, uh, and so they are responsible for that. And of course, a meteorologist in charge, or MIC, um, that is, uh, oversees all the administrative as well as the, the head, kind of like the, your head scientist in, in here as well. And so that's part of the full staffing complement. Um, what you're standing is actually 14 feet above sea level. This height was chosen because for the island of Key West, that is roughly about the highest uh, that a storm surge would be able to make it, well, you know, to this part of the island on there. So that's about how high you need to be to keep your feet dry, so to speak, <laughs> um, in a major hurricane. Is it, mm -hmm. if I can ask a question, is sure. that because, um, so is it because it, it's so shallow around Key West and that's why it, it won't go higher than 14 feet or is yeah. that? It's not actually the shallowness. Having shallow slope actually makes storm surge higher and worse. Oh, okay. It's the channels and the fact that west of Key West is, is open water. Oh. And so the fact that the water isn't impeded just west of the island is why the storm surge isn't as high as per se uh, what could happen on the northern Gulf Coast. Okay. But and generally speaking, and so that's why uh, storm surge can be different up and down the Keys based on how the, the coastline is, whether you have a cove that traps water, et cetera. Okay. But here, because of the open water to the west, that's why the height, pound per pound, you know, inch by inch, is not calculated to be as high in, in a major hurricane as others. But case in point, 14 feet is nothing to sneeze at. No. <laughs> we, if you walked off the steps, um, you would not be able to survive in water that was up to our level here, mm -hmm. so okay. Okay. still very important. Then. Wow. Um, also, if you notice, uh, we use the yard arm uh, flagpole, so these flags that you see above our head, hopefully we don't see hurricane warnings yeah. anytime <laughs> soon, but we do fly the pennants, which are, uh, if you notice on the Weather Bureau symbol, those are all like the, the maritime signal flags, and paying homage back to 1870, um, that's actually a duty of ours. If we do issue a small craft advisory, a single pennant will go up. If it's a gale warning, two pennants, a storm warning or, or tropical storm warning, we fly one red in Lex Square, and then if you pair, fly two of them, that means hurricane warning. We actually do that as part of our duty um, so because a lot of folks are here are engaged in water activities, uh, part of the maritime industry, and just driving up one white street and looking up at the flagpole can kind of let you know. Um, you know, what alerts might be out there yeah. at the time. Yeah, it's something, and in fact, the U.S. Coast Guard is looking into also starting to fly those, well, those warning flags as well. So it's coming back. And it's not just emergency management. If you want to take a look on here, there's a range of public and private partnerships. And, we, and um, those that kind of embrace 
a understanding of the weather hazards here in the Florida Keys and help their own employees or, or well work with the public in partnership, uh, we recognize them as a weather ready nation ambassador. And that's all part of our long term goal a weather ready nation is to help society become more resilient toward weather hazards. You can't do it alone. It takes everything from the grassroots. Um, that, if you look in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, that's Brett. That's okay. Tropical Storm Brett. And then behind it is Cindy. Yeah, if you notice, you see all those high clouds, all the green and blues, and they're over the Western Caribbean, and they're all kind of curving up and down. Well, there's a big trough of low pressure there, and that is going to be the end of Brett. It's going to be strong wind shear. You see there's no thunderstorms there, and very, you see the, the warm water. That's why it's showing up in a dark shade there. Okay. Because the warm Caribbean water, it's dry there. And so Brett's not going to live for too much longer. Well, that's counting great. that and will <laughs> dissipate in the Western Caribbean. And Cindy, because of that same trough, is going to take a right turn and end up, you know, hopefully in the open waters of the Atlantic. And, and so uh, it's an early start. It's a little early to see things out there um, in the middle of the Atlantic. Mm. But when you look at our continent, you see the thunderstorms, the rain, there's the big trough of low pressure there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit early to get things over into our neck of the woods. So. Okay. Uh, so yes, there are things out there, but we don't have any threats to the Florida Keys right at this time. Hi, I'm Chip Casper. I'm the meteorologist in charge here at the NOAA Florida Keys National Weather Service office in Key West, Florida. And we're standing in front of our uh, NOAA Heritage Wall. Uh, this was put together by a team um, from our office, including uh, Dave Ross, uh, Catherine Leninger, and Nancy Barnhart a few years ago, actually during the pandemic where we um, received a small grant from the NOAA Heritage Project and we were able to put together, uh, design and implement this uh, heritage wall which shows the timeline of our uh, history uh, here in the Florida Keys. Um, you know, the uh, Weather Service and the Weather Bureau, uh, before the Weather Service, um, uh, we've had a long history here in Key West going back to the founding of the Weather Bureau in 1870 under the Army Signal Corps and then through the years uh, we've had various facilities around the community of Key West and of course have dealt with um, a lot of change during that time. You know, a uh, couple world wars, lots of hurricanes, Great Depression, pandemic. And so this kind of highlights some of those events um, with little uh, tidbits of information, pictures. And uh, this wall, which is here at our forecast office in Key West, also has a companion website. Uh, if you go to our website, weather.gov slash key, uh, you'll find um, a version of this on there along with a story map and um, lots of information. So uh, this was a really neat project, really had a lot of fun doing it and uh, really kind of, uh, you know, provides a lot of information about our history as well as our mission here uh, in the Florida Keys. Uh, moving on, uh, we will encounter a logo of the Florida Keys extending from the mainland of Florida all the way out to the Dry Tortugas, but also we have uh, an area of maritime responsibility where we provide forecasts of winds and waves and marine weather um, from the territorial waters of Cuba all the way up through the channels between the Keys up off the coast of uh, Marco Island and then east from the Bahama Banks all the way west past the Dry Tortugas into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico. The Straits of Florida which lie uh, between here and Cuba have some of the busiest shipping lanes on the planet. Uh, and the Department of Defense has estimated 40% of the world's maritime commerce actually travels through those, uh, through those uh, shipping lanes. And then, of course, closer to home here in the Keys, you know, we have very active fishing and diving and recreational boating and sunset cruises and kayaking and you name it, we can do it here in the Florida Keys year-round. So all these folks need uh, marine weather uh, forecast information in order to you know, have safe, um, safe uh, transits out on the water, and that's kind of uh, what Chris is doing here. And we have a forecast horizon of about a week, so every every day we push it out one more day, and so we forecast from uh, the current day out seven days. It's sitting from a geostationary satellite, and that's what you're seeing in this view here. You can see a picture of the globe, and in blue lines you can see the outline of North America. This this satellite sits about. 22,000 feet off, or 22,000 miles off the surface. And so if you were to picture the distance from here to here, what is 22,000? That, that satellite's probably way back here, okay. sitting way out in a geostationary orbit, kind of spinning at the same speed as the globe. That's why it always has the same picture. 
but we can see all the way to Africa, all the way into the Eastern Pacific. And we actually have a second one of these, which I'm not gonna show you, but that sits way over here, that sees out to Hawaii. With this satellite channel here that we have, so it has a whole bunch of channels, 15 different channels that kind of filters things and assesses things. This one's assessing water vapor imagery. And in blue and white, you can see kind of moisture motions and yellows and oranges, it's kind of dry sinking air. But what you really, you're seeing the patterns of the atmosphere at about 20,000 feet. So the mid-level of the atmosphere, it kind of controls everything at the surface. But we also have other channels. Um, some of the other channels we have is infrared imagery. And so this is just, tell me how cold the clouds are. And cold clouds are tall clouds. So in this instance, it's telling me where are there thunderstorms. And so all this is thunderstorms, thunderstorms, and three tropical systems kind of slowly tracking across the tropical Atlantic, which may be a little early for this time of year, but it's kind of normal. I mean, the ocean's warm, it's got moisture, and they, they slide off Africa and slowly march this way. In this instance, I can tell just from the water vapor imagery, once we get to the last, there's a lot of wind shear. Tropical cyclones don't like wind shear, and so they're, most of them are getting kind of decapitated. So the wind shear is kind of destroying these systems as they approach us. Our third and favorite channel, most detail, is the visible imagery. But the problem with the visible imagery is when it goes night, it can't see anything. But you can see sunrise here, you can see sunset here, but if you watch as this satellite goes across, you'll see little flashes of light right at zenith see there was one there was another one little that's basically saying there's the sea heights are flat calm so the the sun is bouncing right off the surface and reflecting back sort of an albedo effect so i told you this is the most detailed but it doesn't look very detailed to me so we have to zoom in and so every one of those pixels on there is 250 meters by 250 meters and it's absolutely astounding if you think that camera is 22,000 miles away yeah now for us you can see high clouds sliding this way we got low clouds going this way low clouds up here sliding this way kind of different directions so we have a layer cake of the atmosphere um, how is it useful it's useful with, with tropical cyclones because a lot of times tropical cyclones are covered by thunderstorms we can't tell what's happening at the surface and so in this case we can actually see where the center of this very sheared system brett is sliding west through the eastern uh, caribbean and we can see those low, low, that's, they know the hurricane center and it's right there. But if it's covered in storms, what do we do? We send an airplane out there. The airplane's gotta find the center. Last but not least, this, these satellites, I mean, it's, I mean, absolutely, if they never change the technology and I retire in 20 years, I'll be completely happy with this camera they gave me. And it would actually, be, during my career, they updated the satellites. And Chip, what was the resolution on your first satellite? Oh gosh, it was the best one was I think four kilometers. Four kilometers, back so in we're now 90s. 250 meters per per pixel. Um, they, we can even detect fires with this. So just just watch, see if you see any. See that flash? That's basically the, okay. the satellite saying that's a hot square right there. And so even before people may know on the ground, the satellite's seeing hot temperatures. So incredibly detailed. And in this case. I talked about two channels of the, of the satellite, the visible satellite and the infrared. I've sandwiched them both together here. So it's kind of a combo image where I can see the low level cloud motions, the detail of the building cumulus, but also can see the coldness of the cloud temperatures here. So, you know, Chris is, like I said, doing the, the long-term forecast. Um, on, you know, we're also doing short-term forecasting. We have a responsibility by, by law to provide a forecast for aviation to keep uh, flights safe. And so in the Florida Keys, we provide specialized, uh, what we call TAFs or terminal aerodrome forecasts for the, our two main airports, which is Key West International Airport and um, Marathon Florida Keys International Airport up in Marathon. And so we provide forecasts every six hours, 24 seven, just, just for those, just for a five mile um, area, uh, you know, radius around those airfields. And um, of course, you know, we provide updated amendments or you know updated forecasts when necessary as well. The other thing we do here at this office and um, about uh, I think close to 90 areas around the United States and almost 800 worldwide is we release weather balloons um, to sample the atmosphere in the vertical. Um, we do that routinely twice per day, and um, basically uh, this is something that the Weather Service has been doing for you know, um, almost 100 years, really. It started in the late 30s. Um, technology's a little different now. You know, we've upgraded the systems a few times, but basically the concept is the same. We release a balloon with a small payload attached to it. 
Um, it's gotten smaller over the years as we you know, improve the technology, but basically we're measuring temperature, humidity, pressure, and winds from the surface all the way up to the top of the atmosphere when those balloons pop at about 100,000 feet on average above ground. Um, greater than 99% of the mass of the atmosphere is below that level. So this gives us a really good, um, a really good diagnostic tool to study the, uh, the atmosphere, the local atmosphere. But also, um, this program, which I said is uh, worldwide, um, allows all the nations that run uh, numerical models uh, across the globe to uh, share data. And so uh, there's a program under the United Nations um, World Meteorological Organization that basically manages um, the standards for data collection and then the sharing of data across all the world's meteorological services for the, you know, really for safety, uh, public safety and safety of life at sea as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's something we do every day. And if we have something like a hurricane approaching, then we'll increase the frequency uh, in order to get better data, um, you know, for, for a landfalling hurricane. So, you know, the forecast process has really improved a lot over the years. Um, numerical models and methods are very important to us nowadays. But, you know, we still, in order to develop uh, expertise, you know, it's basically you know, a forecast can be considered a diagnosis plus a trend. And so it all starts with what Chris showed you, the observations, um, understanding what's going on outside right now and why. And using the conceptual models that we learn going to meteorology school and applying that and then using the model guidance intelligently and responsibly. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do here every day um, in the Florida Keys. And again, these folks uh, work around the clock uh, I mean, not 24 hours each of them, but we have shifts, that, different shifts that come in um, in order to make, make sure that we're, you know, um, executing our mission of protecting life and property. The professional meteorologists at the National Weather Service in Key West have been monitoring and predicting the weather for over 150 years. While the instruments and technology have changed, their mission has not, to keep the residents and tourists safe from dangerous weather and hurricanes. We have provided links in the description below for steps you can take to protect yourself in severe weather.